I'm uh, uh, from Montmacdonald, and um, uh, the way I'd like to approach the lecture this afternoon it is really in, in two parts. If we can just get this started, Belts and Braces Man is coming back. Um, so first, what I'd like to do is uh, give a very high-level overview uh, of the most important issues uh, in water globally. Uh, and then secondly, uh, I'd like to focus in uh, on issues that are specific to more developed economies um, with well-developed infrastructure. Uh, but in order to get into that, first let me give you a little bit um, about myself so that you can see where my perspectives come from. So I joined Mott McDonald in 1987, uh, and I've been there ever since. Um, and very soon after joining, I went off to do an MSc, because back in those days, I was young and idealistic. I wanted to save the world. I thought that the key issue to do that was something to do with water and sanitation. So I took myself off to do a master's in tropical public health engineering. Came back into Mott McDonald, became a process engineer, uh, and spent quite a bit of the 90s uh, being a proper engineer. I was designing stuff, uh, mainly wastewater treatment works. Um, and then, I guess, quite a bit later on, uh, I felt that I needed a change. Uh, took myself off and did an MBA, uh, and then turned up, uh, seconded into Anglian Water, uh, where by this time I was the engineering manager, uh, and it was my uh, responsibility, well, I was accountable for the technical delivery of uh, the output on a billion pound programme. Uh, and while I was there, um, we did some quite fun stuff. Uh, we introduced uh, BIM, Building Information Modelling, uh, Product-Based Delivery, DFMA, which is designed for manufacturing assembly. And we also did quite a bit of work on uh, low-carbon construction. So it was off the back of that, when I came back into Mott McDonald after a seven-year secondment into Angling Water, um, that I uh, was the lead author of the Infrastructure Carbon Review. And so this is a Treasury report, and the idea of this report is that uh, it focuses uh, on where carbon is in UK infrastructure, and then it talks about how to get rid of that carbon in UK infrastructure. So when I came back into Mott McDonald, having been seconded for that, uh, I took up my current role, and the current role uh, as the uh, Global Head of, uh, of Water and Environment uh, is that I do a lot of travelling. So the irony is not lost on me. <laughs> that uh, having told everyone how to save carbon, I go and then burn an awful lot of it. Uh, but uh, it is a privilege to see the water industry in various different forms around the world. Uh, and it's really from that perspective uh, that I'd like to, uh, like to give this, this talk uh, as I give this brief overview of, of global water issues. And I think if we are going to have a truly global view, uh, we really need to start in space. Uh, and from space, we look down on this achingly beautiful planet, the blue planet, 70% covered in water, uh, and it looks like there's a lot of water. It's just that 97.5% of it is salt water. Uh, and of the 2.5% uh, that is fresh water, 69% is frozen, 31% is underground, and less than 1% is in rivers and lakes. So there's so much water. There's actually enough water. It's just that it's in the wrong place, and it's full of salt. So this is where water engineers come in. It's our job to get clean, fresh water to where it's needed and then back into the environment with no detriment. And I reckon the water sector is a great sector to work in. Uh, but to me, it's more than a sector uh, because it's essential to life. It's fundamental to society. It affects people, the economy and the environment. And really, all is not well in the world of water. There are unprecedented challenges on the global water um, and these are likely to face us for at least the coming decades. And there are so many issues, so many overlapping issues, that it becomes quite complicated to unpick what are causes, what are effects, what are trends, what are problems, and what are solutions. Um, and so it's very easy for us to just go round and round in circles and not make any sense of it all. Uh, so what I'd like to do as a simplification uh, is to put to you one huge problem um, one huge global issue, uh, and then five megatrends uh, that I see as driving much of the rest of what we see happening in the world of water. So for the big issue um, facing humankind in relation to water, I'd suggest it's to do with a combination of water, energy and food security. This is increasingly being called the nexus, the meeting point. 
Growing populations, increasing demand for energy, food and water are creating a perfect storm. And climate change will clearly exacerbate all of those things in unpredictable ways. And with the global population growing at a rate of approximately 80 million people per year, by 2030, it's estimated that we'll need 40% more water, 36% more energy, and 50% more food. And to meet this growing demand for water, food, and energy, we can no longer deal with these things uh, as separate things because they're so interlinked. And Nexus Thinking recognises that all of these interconnect and that the solution really must uh, consider all three and not just focus on, on one. So as an example, uh, agriculture uses about 70% of the world's fresh water, and we remember how little of that there is relatively. It takes an amazing 15,000 litres of water for every one kilogram of grain-fed beef, which is absolutely astonishing. And water is also in demand in the energy sector to cool power stations, drive turbines. And the water that we use every day requires vast amounts of energy. It's estimated that between 2 and 3% of global energy consumption is used in pumping and treating water for industrial and residential purposes. And then to complete this kind of global scale game of rock, paper, scissors, uh, we see agricultural land being over, given over to the production of energy rather than food. Uh, either producing crops for, crops for biofuels or becoming solar farms. So the solution is really to integrate water, energy and food planning. It's to reduce water dependency and enhance efficiency. Though I do have to add that if I speak to my colleagues in the power unit, they will say that it's not a nexus at all, that actually there's only one problem and that problem is energy because if you've got enough energy, all the other problems go away. So clearly this global issue affects us all, uh, but it is worth noting that the people who get the worst deal, the people at the bottom of the pile, are the urban poor. And as we'll see, this is a relatively new phenomenon. So if that's the big issue, now for the megatrends. Now a megatrend is a global, sustained, macro-level force that impacts <coughs> sectors, economies, societies, cultures and personal lives, and thereby defines the future world. There are many others to choose from, and I guess I could choose something about rising conflict with violent extremists, but I offer these uh, as the ones that most affect water. These megatrends are like train tracks that humanity is travelling down. They're just there, they're what's happening, and we can't stop them, but we can influence how we operate within the situation that they create. And these megatrends don't look like good news. Rather, they do look a bit like doom and gloom. They may seem a bit like the four horsemen of the apocalypse. But I think that recognising them brings attention to the issues and hopefully leads to solutions, as long as those solutions are in time. So the megatrends are challenges, but they're also the drivers of change. Thankfully, there are also some positive trends, and I'll come back to that later, so you don't get too depressed as I go through all of these. But what we'll do is look at each of these megatrends in turn, and I'll pick out some key points to try and illustrate them. So starting off with climate change, I guess the first point here is that it's real. It's really happening. The serious scientific community is in consensus. And if we look at the findings of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, they're frankly scary. I won't read them all, but here's just a few. Uh, warming of the climate system is unequivocal. Each of the last three decades has been successfully warmer than the preceding decade. Arctic sea ice has continued to decrease. Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets have been losing mass and glaciers have continued to shrink. Oceans are warming. The rate of sea level rise has been higher than during the previous two millennia. So it's happening. Ralph Cicciarone, a one-time US National Academy, Academy president, described three possible responses to climate change as, oh, as, mitigation, adaptation, and suffering. And uh, I think if we look at mitigation, there's a real possibility that humanity's just about given up on this. We'll see what Paris comes up with, but humanity is not really doing very well on mitigation. Adaptation is fine for the rich. The rich are doing this for themselves, and that really leaves the only other option for the poor, suffering. Uh, and again, it's really the urban poor who really suffer. 
The World Bank warns that a billion people living in slums are at greater risk from climate change. So their study, uh, Climate Change Disaster Risk in the Urban Poor, that sounds like a good read, doesn't it? says that uh, exposure to risk is often exacerbated by several factors common to urban slums, including lack of adequate infrastructure and services, unsafe housing, inadequate nutrition, and poor health. So climate change can lead to this really ironic situation of having both too much water and too little water at the very same time. So on to the second horseman, resource limitation. So there's growing awareness that water scarcity is going to be one of the biggest global challenges facing humanity uh, in the coming century, or in this century. Um, and uh, if we look at this, we can see uh, where the main areas of water stress are, are likely to be. It's not just about water stress, it's also about lack of access. So we have 780 million people who lack access to improved water source, uh, and approximately one in nine people, that is. Uh, on top of this, there's an additional injustice to do with virtual water, and that is that poor, dry countries effectively export their water to uh, wet, rich countries via the products that we import. Um, so when it comes to this kind of water stress, particularly in urban areas, uh, there are some things which we're, we're going to have to get used to. Uh, and one of those, I believe, uh, is that we as humanity are going to have to get used to reuse. So call it toilet to tap. It goes a little bit beyond what the Californians like to call uh, showers to flowers. Uh, it's something that is already happening. Singapore are doing this rather well. Uh, but uh, particularly in urban areas, we are going to have to get used uh, to the idea of toilet to tap. But limitation of uh, resources is not just about water. Um, there are other limitations, like on concrete and steel. Uh, and the water industry is basically built on these things. Um, but it's not only those, there's um, a drastic uh, limitation of human resource as well, a lack of skills to serve the global water needs, and this really does need to be addressed. And interestingly, if we think about skills and people working in the water industry, if you count the people who collect water uh, <coughs> as working in the water industry, uh, and we look at the global water sector workforce, 80% uh, of them are women. Uh, in developed economies, uh, the workforce in the water sector, you've got about 5 to 10% of women. So there's something wrong going on there as well. So now if we look at population concentration, it's not just that there'll be more people, which is the population increase, it's also that there'll be more people in less area, which is the urbanisation point. It's estimated that 400 million people will move to Indian cities by 2050. Uh, so I'm trying to move it on. Um, so in Asia, the urban agglomerations of Dhaka, Karachi, Jakarta, Mumbai, Delhi, Manila, Seoul, Beijing, they're already home to about 20 million people. The Pearl River Delta, Shanghai, Shuzhou and Tokyo are forecast to have 40 million within the coming decade. Almost unbelievable numbers. Outside of Asia, uh, Mexico City, Sao Paulo, New York City, Lagos, Cairo, they're all in the region of 20 million inhabitants. And note on this, uh, this picture the strong similarity with a map that I showed earlier on on water stress. And not surprisingly, many of the foci for urbanisation are exactly the same places as where there's water stress. So the breakpoint apparently happened in 2008. So in the first time in the history of humankind, it's now estimated that more people live in towns and cities uh, than in rural areas. Uh, but currently one third of those live in slums, the urban poor. Uh, and this is significant for me because when I started my career uh, the big issue was about water supply and sanitation for the rural poor. Now it's water supply and sanitation for the urban poor. It's shifted even in my own, uh, my own career. And we see that the 30-70 ratio is basically reversed in just a hundred years. However this is not all bad um, greater concentrations of people lead to more innovation uh, and more rapid development of ideas uh, created by there being more connections uh, in urban areas. So Geoffrey West, a, a stats expert, has shown that cities scale in what he calls a superlinear fashion with an exponent of 1.15. So there you've got some maths in there. Um, it basically means that when a city population doubles, the innovation more than doubles. So there is some hope. Um, and then there's middle-classisation. Um, 
the rampant rise of the middle classes. Uh, so the rise of the middle class is rising faster than the overall rate of population. It's rising faster even than the rate of urbanisation. So it's expected that there'll be 3.2 billion middle class by the end of the decade and 4.9 billion by 2030. And in particular, Asia's middle class is forecast to triple to 1.7 billion by 2020. So this income group will have the greatest impacts uh, on products and services uh, and also they have the greatest purchasing power. So they, the middle class, but it's also us, uh, we use more water per capita than anyone else and so we contribute to the problem. Uh, again, this is not necessarily all bad because the pointy elbowed middle classes, we're better at demanding better services uh, and there is some hope that as we demand better services, uh, that those better services uh, will then feed down to, to all. So investment constraint, if you're not too depressed yet, uh, the world economy is still not in a happy place uh, and it doesn't look like it's gonna get in a happy place anytime soon. Um, but the thing is with investment constraint, it's not just about there being money around in the economy, even if there is money around, it often doesn't go into the water sector. Um, and so if we look at the sensitive issue of tariff uh, related clearly to investment constraint, um, there's a mismatch, a very big mismatch between the cost and the price and the value of water. And in a rational water economy, not only the operation costs, but also the capital maintenance and the investment costs will be covered by what people pay for water. And that then means that people get the water they need and the service they need. Uh, and where there isn't full cost recovery, uh, there's a danger of developing what's known as a tariff trap. So in the tariff trap, where the tariff is too low to cover the investment, this leads to poor quality water and poor service, which then leads to an unwillingness to pay to improve more quality. And so people get trapped in uh, low tariffs and low quality. Um, and it's very difficult to break out of that. Uh, and few countries have managed it. Um, famously, Manila Water has done it, but unfortunately not many have copied that. Uh, and then this leads to an even greater injustice which is that those who end up paying the most for water are those who can least afford it. Uh, and we'll dig into this in a little bit more detail. So, you might have been wondering what on earth that picture was up there for when I was talking about tariff traps. So this is probably the most expensive bottled water in the world. Uh, it costs $60,000 for 70, uh, 75 centilitres, a, uh, a bottle of wine size. So if you work that up, that's $80 million per metre cubed. That's breathtaking and uh, frankly obscene. Uh, the bottle is made of pure gold. Uh, it comes with a leather case. Uh, and it's also, it contains five milligrams per litre of gold dust. Why? Seriously, why? Um, but if we look at the real cost of real water in the real world, uh, and this is a, a kind of a, an average um, but it, it illustrates an important point I want to draw out later. So the average water only cost is $2.15 per meter cubed. Compare that to 80 million. The average wastewater only, $2.24. So if you're going to go for both uh, water and wastewater, it's a total of $4.40 per meter cubed. Now when we look at a willingness to pay, uh, we've all done it. We've all gone and bought a, a bottle, you know, bottled water. Uh, what we're paying there is between $400 and $2,000 per metre cubed in comparison. So the average cost of water, just over $4 per metre cubed, we end up paying $2,000 per metre cubed. Um, and just incidentally, uh, the cost of heating your water for showering is about uh, $4 per metre cubed as well. Uh, and so it costs more to heat water than it does to pump and treat it. But now comes the killer comparison. So the cost of water in a Nairobi slum uh, is $38 per metre cubed. Uh, and the tariff is often worked out on a very simple basis, which is all you can carry for the smallest coin. So whatever the smallest coin is, you take that, and all you can carry, you walk away, it works out at about $38 per metre cubed. Trouble is, you wouldn't want to drink that. So when you get it back to your hovel, 
Um, you have to boil it if you want to drink it, unless you, you want to get sick. Um, so you boil the water for disinfection, uh, and the cost of that is about $49 per metre cubed. So you add all of that up, so the cost of water for the poorest, and this is what they pay, is $87 per metre cubed. Of course, they never get a metre cubed. It's much less than that. Um, but this really does illustrate the point uh, that with the proper water at the proper price, uh, the poor would be willing to pay. Because who wouldn't want to pay $4 per metre cubed rather than 87 uh, And those who lack access to water are not homogeneously, homogeneously poor. Uh, nearly 66% 60 of people who lack um, safe drinking water live on less than $2 a day, while 33% live on less than $1 a day. So you see how much they have available to pay on water. Uh, and the UNDP says that people living in informal settlements uh, often pay five to ten uh, times more per litre of water than the wealthy people living in the same cities. So if we look at uh, the increase in access to, um, to water in developing countries, and so this graph just shows the increase in developing countries, uh, there's been an increase in the proportion of the population that have access to clean water. But it's been very slow, uh, very slow, I think. You can see it goes up a little bit. Uh, but in comparison, the access to mobile phones <laughs> in those same countries has uh, been going up like that over 10 years. So here's an astonishing factoid for you. More people now have a mobile phone than have a toilet. Uh, and in Africa, 90% um, of the work of fetching water in rural areas uh, with no access to, uh, to water in their homes. So this is the, the, the difference between the water in one kilometre water and uh, water in the home. That collection is done by women. <coughs> uh, and this could probably explain the stubborn difference uh, between those two lines. Uh, and that, kind of put rather boldly, is that um, as far as the men are concerned, there is water in the home. The women go and collect it. There's water in the home. So what's the problem? Um, and as men don't notice that there's a problem, then men don't solve it. And so you keep having this, this difference between those two lines. So most importantly, this is dreadful for women. Um, not only today's women, but the women of tomorrow. It reduces their quality of life and pre prevents them doing something better. Uh, but also, it represents uh, an enormous opportunity cost. It's lost productivity to the world economy. So anyway, enough of the doom and gloom. <clears throat> there must be some good news somewhere. Uh, well, maybe. There's all these negative megatrends going downwards. <clears throat> uh, maybe there's one going the other way. And that's to do with digital abundance. The rapid and ongoing reduction in the unit cost of collecting, communicating, processing, and storing information is leading to this state of digital abundance. Uh, and what we're seeing as a result of that is an information explosion, rapid increase in the volume of published uh, data and information. This is the whole stuff of technology, big data, Internet of Things, smart everything. We also see um, an innovation explosion, a rapid increase of ideas and innovations in various information-related fields that could benefit infrastructure. Um, and this really leads to a kind of fundamental shift. Um, if, if a resource that was formerly scarce uh, becomes abundant, then it changes the economy related to that, that, that particular resource. And so we see digital abundance uh, shifting a balance uh, and creating a new order. And I think it's just the start of which we're beginning to see. And certainly, it's hardly impacted the world of water yet. And according to the Oxford English Dictionary, the term information explosion was first coined in 1941. But they knew nothing then. Because apparently, 90% of the world's data was generated over the last two years. Um, this diagram is just given to try and provide a, a sense of scale. Because I guess we're all familiar with gigabytes. We, we've got our heads around that. And so let's say that a gigabyte is equivalent to the height of a short person. And an exabyte is a billion gigabytes. That would be equivalent to the diameter of the sun. OK? So all the words ever spoken by human beings could be stored as text in approximately five exabytes of data. So you got the, you got the feel of it. But according to IBM, 2.5 exabytes of data is generated every day. 
Um, and there's an argument that maybe most of this is videos of kittens, <laughs> but <laughs> it's data. Um, Buckminster Fuller came up what he called the knowledge doubling curve, <clears throat> and he observed uh, that until the, uh, about 1900, um, human knowledge doubled approximately every century. He then worked out that uh, by the end of World War II, knowledge was doubling about every 25 years. Today, things are not as simple as that, uh, and it looks like knowledge doubles at different rates in different parts of, of, uh, of, kind of technical, uh, technical areas. So, for example, nanotechnology, someone has estimated, is doubling every two years, clinical knowledge every 18 months. But on average, uh, they say that human knowledge is doubling every 13 months. So that sounds a lot faster. But according to IBM, uh, when the Internet of Things is built out, this will lead to a doubling of knowledge every 12 hours. And clearly, there's a difference between data and information and knowledge. But whichever one of those you consider, uh, they're all growing exponentially. And likewise, innovation is, uh, is growing exponentially. Um, we've all heard of Moore's Law, in which the number of transistors you can get on a chip uh, of the same size doubles every two years. Um, but I reckon that there's something similar that uh, you could apply to all sorts of uh, other areas, other fields of innovation. And as an example, here's a graph that I produced uh, from data that I pulled off Wikipedia, wonderful thing that it is, um, about the uh, power to weight ratio of flying machines. So from the Wright Flyer in 1903 uh, through to today, the power to weight ratio has doubled every 13 years, uh, and it shows no sign of stopping. So each time we reach the limit of one technology, then we invent another. So the internal combustion engine gives way to the turbojet, gives way to the turbo pump, the ramjet, the scramjet, and each time it goes up, we, we're doubling our power to weight ratio in flying machines every 13 years. And maybe we don't feel like innovation is exponential because we're always sitting on the end of the curve. Uh, but I think um, if we can't even accept that it's an exponential increase, just a linear increase in innovation is something worth getting excited about. And I think there's another key point about innovation, which is that uh, its mother really is necessity. Um, and I guess uh, a pertinent example of this, uh, with a recent remembrance of the Battle of Britain, uh, is a little story about the Merlin engine. So when the Merlin engine started off, uh, it was generating something like 600 watts. Uh, they kept on tweaking it and fiddling it and putting turbos on it. Uh, and by the end of the war, they were getting 2.4 megawatts out of the same engine, which is phenomenal. But they weren't just tweaking on the power side, they're also reducing the unit cost. And so over just the period of the war, so in exactly the war years, there was a 700% increase in the power per pound, which is absolutely as astonishing. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why the war turned out like it did. Um, <clears throat> so I've presented four global megatrends uh, going down and one potentially going up. But what does this mean for water globally? Is there going to be a happy ending? Uh, and I think it's hard to tell. Um, and I think the reason why it's hard to tell is because technology and engineering solutions are, are not the issue. Because we can do that. We can do the engineering, we can do the technology. I think the issue is human nature. Uh, and it's really hard to tell whether or not we can collectively be sensible enough uh, to sort out all those problems. My guess is that we can. Big question. <coughs> so now, onto the second bit. <coughs> so that's presented the kind of the big global issues um, of, of water. And I think those apply to every uh, single economy. Uh, the developing ones as well as the, um, the most developed ones. Uh, and I think it's in that context that I'd like to focus on some uh, emerging trends that are specific to economies that are well developed uh, and have infrastructure that is well developed. Uh, because I think that these trends uh, point towards what might be the future of infrastructure. So the, the thought flow that I'm going to try and run through is that I'll introduce the concept of an infrastructure maturity curve and I'll illustrate it using UK water infrastructure. And I'll use that to argue that we need a shift in thinking. Then I'll introduce a stakeholder network diagram and I'll use that to try and point out that the network is to serve the ultimate customer. 
And I'll do that in order to argue that the, the key value driver for the future is outcome per pound for the ultimate customer. And finally, uh, I'll show how some of these might deliver value. So here is the uh, infrastructure maturity curve. Simple S-curve that describes the development of infrastructure uh, in terms of the development of that infrastructure um, network against time. So it's essentially a technology adoption curve uh, and it has three distinct phases. So there's the emergence phase uh, and for infrastructure and water infrastructure in particular, this is where there's a need for institutional strengthening and capacity building. It's all about establishing an industry structure the rule of law, contract law, actually establishing a supply chain so that you can even start building things. Uh, and many countries don't even have that in place at the moment. So this, this emergent phase is characterised by development projects, um, a lack of local skilled resources, uh, and more often than not, um, quite a lot of corruption goes on as well. Uh, in the growth phase, uh, this is all about building. It's about getting stuff built. There's now uh, a construction sector that can go and build things, and there's the, all the laws in place to, to be able to support that. So the growth phase is all about just go out and build it. Uh, and so the focus is on asset creation. Uh, it's about building the infrastructure network. It's about increasing capacity with built solutions. Um, and more often than not, the solutions are, are, are quite uh, traditional. Uh, very often they're greenfield projects. Uh, and in terms of contract solutions, normally the reward is rewarding output. So in the mature phase, <coughs> I think we can say that infrastructure has reached um, a phase of maturity when the value of infrastructure in use is much greater, substantially greater, than the value of infrastructure in development. And so in this phase, um, mature infrastructure is characterised by more asset management, um, less asset creation. Quite simply, there's more there to manage. Um, and so uh, we see in, in areas that, uh, uh, that have mature infrastructure, the professionalisation of asset management uh, is, is something to be noted. Also, there's more brownfield, less greenfield. Um, and that's just because greenfield development, it, it, there aren't any greenfields to go and build on. Uh, sp space is scarce uh, and often expensive and protected. So most work in mature infrastructure is about interfacing with assets that are already there and very often coming up very close to the users of those assets. And also what we see in uh, mature infrastructure is more enhancement and less new build. So we often have to get more out of what we've already got rather than just going and building solutions. So <clears throat> just to show that this, um, this curve is a real thing, um, here is uh, some S-curves from America. Now, most of these seem to relate to telecommunications and there's a few odds, odds in there uh, and also some stuff to do with transportation. Uh, but what I think is quite interesting to see there is that the more modern infrastructure goes up the S-curve a lot quicker. Uh, and I think that's just another sign that the, the world is speeding up. Uh, but it's trying to show that this uh, S-curve of development in infrastructure is a real thing. Um, so if we now relate this to UK water infrastructure and, and just to kind of overlay the history of uh, UK water infrastructure onto that S-curve, um, in pre-emergence, we might ask, what did the Romans ever do for us? Uh, and the truth is, a lot. Uh, they basically brought water engineering to this country. Uh, there's still some of it to see in St Albans, Chester, Dorchester, aqueducts all over the place. Uh, but then we had the Dark Ages, the kind of the dirty Dark Ages, so we pretty much had to start from scratch again. Um, and then we get to the true emergence, which I reckon probably happened from the 16th century onwards. Uh, at that time, it was just private supplies, uh, piped water into some cities, um, but the supplies were untreated, uh, the sewers were open, uh, often open ditches, and there was no wastewater treatment. So uh, it was pretty dodgy down, down at the emergence phase. But then we had growth, uh, and the Victorians came along, and they basically institutionalised the water industry, and there was huge growth. Uh, particularly following the Great Stink of 1858, and Joseph uh, Basil Gett, Basil Jett, however it is pronounced, did his amazing things in, in London. Uh, and so we saw water supplies for major cities, uh, and it set up a recognisable water industry. 
Uh, during the first half of the last century, there was a lot of growth as well, but a proliferation of suppliers, so that by the time of the war, uh, there were a 1,000 bodies uh, involved in supplying water and 1,400 bodies involved in treating wastewater. Uh, so it was a bit of a mess, really. Um, we saw more significant investment in the 70s. The Water Act, uh, 1973, established uh, 10 regional water authorities. So it's taking all that mishmash of lots of little ones and joining them into more sensible ones, which are based on, um, on river basins. And then we had privatisation in 1990, 1989, which also released a whole, whole bunch more uh, growth. And um, I think what that then leads us to is a state of maturity now. So now we have £350 billion worth of constructed asset uh, in the water industry. And each year we add £1.8 billion. So that's 0.52%. So there's a great big throbbing machine of the existing infrastructure, and each year we add a tiny little bit. So that is pretty much the definition of what uh, mature infrastructure is, is about. Um, and in this, um, in this new world in, uh, in the UK, uh, what it's left us with is uh, 10 uh, water and sewerage companies illustrated there. Uh, there's eight water-only companies. Uh, and a whole bunch of regulators that, that keep them honest. So there's Offwatt, which uh, is an economic regulator and basically looks after customers' interests. Uh, but you've also got the Environment Agency, which looks after the environment's interest, and the Drinking Water Inspectorate that keeps water clean. Um, and since privatisation, there's been £85 billion invested. So if we just have a quick look at what's happened uh, in terms of the results, uh, I'm not saying privatisation is a good thing or a bad thing, uh, just it happened, and this is what has happened since. Um, so we see that um, capital investment has increased significantly. Um, bills have stayed down, and water quality has improved. Um, and that has largely been driven, I believe, by a, a very effective um, approach to governance in the UK water industry. Uh, Offwatt has been remarkably successful uh, as a water regulator uh, and um, the water companies have been very responsive to that. So we see some really dramatic results in the UK water industry which leads us to a very good place. Uh, and now uh, here we are in what is called AMP6, so it's the sixth five-year asset management plan uh, and Offwatt are pushing a number of, of key issues. Uh, and I think that these key issues point towards some really important things for infrastructure. The first one, as always, is efficiencies. That never goes off the list. Uh, but also, they're really pushing a focus on customers, the ultimate customer, uh, and outcomes for the ultimate customer. And this is being encouraged by the regulator. And they're also pushing something called Totex, which is uh, an approach to whole life cost. So I think those two things uh, are pointing towards something very good for infrastructure. Uh, really understanding the importance of the ultimate customer and also looking at a genuine whole life cost um, means of not just decision making but, but running the whole business. So, if we accept that um, the uh, UK water infrastructure networks are mature, this has all sorts of implications uh, for the, the thinking. Now, what we see here um, is a, a split between the infrastructure in use, the £350 billion of the throbbing machine working, which is all about asset management and operation. And then we've got the tiddly little bit, which keeps on getting added in each year, which is infrastructure in development. Uh, and that's about asset creation and enhancement. Um, and that is one network, uh, a very important one. I'm trying to emphasise that, that this shows that the... Uh, the operation and maintenance and use of the network ends up being the most important thing. Uh, but there's another network, and that network is the network of key stakeholders in the industry. Uh, and at the top is the ultimate customer. So the point of this diagram is really to try and show that the ultimate customer is on top, and that su the supply chain, which is where I work, is down at the bottom. Uh, and so the big picture here is about infrastructure in use. It's the network, the throbbing machine, that exists to, to serve the ultimate customer. And everyone else serves the network as they serve the ultimate customer. That has to be the way it goes. And so this key paradigm shift for uh, mature infrastructure is one where we put a, a focus on customer outcomes. 
And it's very different from the growth phase when the main idea was just producing output, you know, building more pipes. It's a big change in, in mindset. Um, and what it leads to is, is a, a real key driver, the key driver of better outcomes for the ultimate customer. And that seems to me to be a kind of a guiding principle for infrastructure going, going forwards. Uh, and if we also take that message of the whole life cost um, for, more, more, uh, for mature infrastructure, it means that um, whole life value becomes the more important thing. Whole life value for the customer and society. Uh, and therefore, I think that uh, it means we can uh, make our decisions much more intelligently uh, when we work off this definition of value, with value being outcome per pound, and that's per whole life pound for the ultimate customer. So if we look at uh, infrastructure through these eyes, um, we see in investment constraint is still going to be an issue. Um, and therefore, there's always going to be this, this need for, um, for efficiency and to get more out of what we've got. Uh, and always, customers and society will demand um, that infrastructure must bounce back uh, after some kind of disruption. So uh, efficiency and resilience um, will still be a key part of, of this future. But in this context, in the context of these things I've just run through, uh, infrastructure solutions will therefore no longer have to be predicated on construction. Uh, with a focus on outcomes, uh, construction will not always be the right answer. Instead, no-build and low-build solutions will often be more cost-effective. And digital infrastructure, particularly overlaying that digital abundance onto infrastructure, opens up a whole load of possibilities that weren't there before and ways of adding value to infrastructure that doesn't mean we have to just go and build our way out of problems all the time. Uh, and so I think with that kind of background, it means that maybe uh, we're due a name change. We talked about the construction industry for a long time. And the construction industry, to me, smacks a lot of the growth phase, where the whole thing is about go and build stuff. You need construction industry, go and build. I think maybe what we should be called is the infrastructure industry, the infrastructure serving the ultimate customer. Um, and there's a whole bunch of things that we can do uh, to, to deliver the value that I've talked about. Now, I'm going to scoot through this fairly fast. I'd love to go into them in more detail, um, but there, there isn't time. Uh, and so I think that there are a number of areas where we can see a potential transformation that will ki deliver the kind of value that I was talking about, um, which is all about outcomes per pound for the ultimate customer. Uh, and those come in, in these headings, the transformation around delivery, uh, how we go about delivering schemes, uh, but also transformation in integration and information. So very briefly, in delivery, there's a whole bunch of things which are started up now uh, some of them I mentioned we were playing with in Anglian Water, but they, they've all, they're all moved on. So here's low carbon construction for you. Um, there's a, an example, a very simple one, uh, a traditional way of putting a, a pipe in the ground. You dig a big hole, uh, you put some bedding on there, you put the, the big pipe in it, uh, and then you import a whole load of fill and you put it around the pipe. Uh, and I don't know what you do with uh, the stuff you've dug, dug out. Uh, but somebody suggested, no, what, no, it's more than somebody suggested. What we did was do a very simple carbon map identify where the carbon is in that top solution. And it was fairly obvious that the carbon was in digging the hole uh, and importing a whole load of material. Uh, and so then you scratch your head and say, how can we remove that carbon? Well, why not make a bucket, which is exactly the same diameter as the pipe, and dig a hole the right size and put it in. And the material that you've dug out, add some soil modification clever stuff to it, and use it as, as backfill. Uh, and so what you do by, by doing that is reduce both the cost and the carbon of the solution, which is pretty clever. Um, BIM, building information modelling, is, is uh, a very clever thing uh, coming to the, uh, the infrastructure industry. It's been in manufacturing for, for yonks. Um, it's more than just 3D modelling. Uh, it's really all about managing information uh, through the delivery process. Uh, but one of those is a model and one of those is a photo. Uh, and so you can see that uh, they get to be very good at uh, developing models. Yeah, the, the one with the, the man in is the real one. Um, and you also see uh, some other clever stuff coming out from building information modelling, going beyond it, uh, having an overlay of the virtual world on the real world, so you can see pipes underground and those kind of things. Uh, DFMA, that's designed for manufacturing assembly, again used for a long time in manufacturing, but coming to construction. Uh, you see here a booster pump station, uh, which is uh, fully designed and built, um, manufactured off-site, 
uh, delivered to site on the back of a truck and, and dropped in place. Uh, so that's a 90% reduction in the time on, on site. Um, and then you've got um, some clever stuff coming our way around uh, new materials and 3D printing. Uh, this one down in the corner is quite a, a nice one where you've got a, a column which is 3D printed so it's, uh, it's more dense on the outside than on the inside uh, which is structurally more efficient. Um, then we see a whole load of potential around uh, integration um, and this is uh, a, about recognising the value of integration. Integration across the infrastructure process uh, integration across the value chain uh, and in fact potentially integration across sectors. Uh, where things are more joined up there's potential to release more value. Um, and the one that I want, to, I want to spend a little bit of time on um, is transformation in information and coming back to this, this, um, this positive mega trend of the digital abundance because this opens up all sorts of possibilities for us um, and uh, I'd like to just touch on, on some of those. So if we look at the basic building information modelling that I introduced very briefly, um, 3D modelling plus, information management in design and construction, that's a good thing. Uh, it provides value and gives us some, some progress. But if you take that same thinking and extend it into asset management, so you're managing information not just in design and construction, but also in asset management, then that's providing more value. And then we can see that if you extend that same thinking and join the information up even more, across infrastructure, then you have this thing, digital infrastructure, which provides uh, more value again. Um, just to touch on what I mean by asset information management, uh, at the moment we see asset information in separate databases, and quite often the database is somebody's drawer with some paper in. Uh, but there's data related to assets is really important. The physical data, which is what it is and where it is, the status data, what state, you know, what state is it in, uh, the performance data, how is it performing, and the condition, da condition data, which is what state is the act actual asset in from a, a condition point of view. Uh, and all of that data is separate, it doesn't connect, and, and the people who need it uh, have a bit of a spaghetti to get to the, the data that they want. Mm -hmm. Now some people suggest that what you need to do therefore is rip out all those databases, stick in a mega database and you know, your problem is solved, but it's not really because that, that won't work. Uh, so the smart money is on the middleware that sits in the middle, makes sense of that data, joins it together so that the guys at the top can make good sense of it uh, and, and manage their assets. So that's asset information, asset information management, uh, and that's built into uh, an ISO now, ISO 55000. I talked about asset management being professionalised. Um, but this is just the beginning. There's more that can be done. Uh, and that's where I think digital infrastructure comes in. So I'd like to just explain this. This is uh, what you might call a Dalek diagram. Uh, it's very, very simple, so forgive me for people who actually know about data. Um, but what we have at, at the base there is a, is a data management layer. Interfaces with the real world uh, gets data from the world in many different ways. Many different kinds of sensors, gets data from social media, data from drone surveys, from GPS, from laser scans, satellite imagery, SCADA, wherever the data comes from, it's coming in there. Now that data is just data and it's quite messy. So a really important thing to be doing in this, this data management layer is to be cleansing the data, to be structuring it, putting it in the right place. Doesn't mean all in one database, uh, but there's a lot of work to do in the data management layer. But it's still just data. And so we have a layer above that, which is where we make sense of, of that, that data um, and turn it into useful intelligence. Uh, and so the kind of thing that we would see in here uh, is the big data analysis where you're having a look through a whole load of data and seeing if there's useful patterns that you can, can make sense of. There's also uh, middleware which will join the, the data together. Um, there's also analytics. Um, and so a whole bunch of stuff goes in there. Um, to make the data useful. It's to make it presentable to humans. And so there's a, a whole need there for visualisation to communicate it. So the, the, the blue arrows are basically communication, uh, and communication machine to machine. And the orange arrow is you know, machine, to, machine to human. Uh, and so what comes out at that level is intelligence. And it's useful to have intelligence. But there's another layer above it, which is the decision-making layer, which is taking that uh, useful information and then making decisions based on it. 
And so in this layer would be decision support tools, which are very important in asset management, but also you would have optimization algorithms, um, machine learning can sit in there, uh, and so potentially you can have self-optimizing optimization algorithms. Uh, but what comes out at that level um, are decisions. Uh, decisions which hopefully uh, are better, uh, faster, uh, cheaper decisions. And that's really the key value proposition um, of digital infrastructure, is that when these things get connected up properly, we end up having better, faster, cheaper decisions. Um, one feature of this model is that it works over lots of different time frames. And so, for example, you can look at the second millisecond time frame. It's this same picture, uh, and that is making operational decisions. So, for example, if you have an outage on water quality, um, then you can shut down your water treatment plant very quickly. Uh, more often than not, humans aren't involved in that. Uh, but then also you can have a, um, a minute, an hour kind of time frame, which would be for reactive maintenance. Something breaks down, you've got to make a decision about going and mending it. Then you might have a decision time frame which is over uh, uh, maybe a day, week, month, which is reactive maintenance des uh, decisions. And then you can also imagine another time frame which might be over years, decades, possibly even centuries, which is about investment planning uh, and retiring assets. But it's the same, the same model applies uh, at each of those kind of logarithmic time, uh, time periods. And I think a key thing about this is that <coughs> uh, it can work uh, even when it's not completely connected up. There's already bits of this. Uh, it's not fully connected. The more connected it gets, the more potential value there is, but also uh, potentially um, more risk. Um, and so if I just touch, I'll come back to the risk point, but a touch on the, on the value proposition again. So I've already mentioned that the core value proposition is that we end up getting improved decisions, better decisions faster. We also get better information to users and operators. Um, that provides customer value, can lead to the um, uh, outcome per pound for the ultimate customer. Um, the infrastructure value, it's easier to add value to infrastructure by overlaying this than it is to just build something. Um, and then also there's information value because where information is lost, that's a loss of value. And what this is doing is not losing that, that value. Um, but the thing is, there's also a risk. Uh, and it seems like there's been a lot of this in the BBC just this week. Um, uh, talking about you know, what, what can go wrong when machines turn, turn bad. Um, and I guess people will be worried about this because of security issues. Um, you, know, you really wouldn't want somebody to, uh, to take over the, the whole of our infrastructure. Uh, that would definitely destroy value for the, uh, the ultimate customer. And then I guess there, there is potentially as well a, a worry of singularity where you have uh, infrastructure becoming intelligent and so uh, you know, the, the robot isn't just an android-looking robot that walks around looking like a human. You know, the robot is the train. Um, but it's maybe not just the robot is the train. The robot is the whole of infrastructure. And I think that's fine when uh, that robot of infrastructure is optimising for the, uh, the best outcome for the customers. Uh, but then it can go bad uh, if it starts uh, optimising <laughs> something else. So with that, I'd like to conclude. Thank <laughs> you.